Two years ago, in the middle of the night, I stood like I'm standing now, but in a swimming pool with a submerged rifle in front of me, aimed at my chest. In my hand, I held the cord leading to the trigger. This is not how I normally spend my Thursday nights. I was shooting a TV series for the national broadcaster here in, in Norway called Life on the Line, in which I test the laws of physics with my life on the line. In this episode, I would entrust my life to the concept of drag, or fluid resistance, the retarding force acting upon a body moving in a fluid. In the pool, I was not supposed to be the body moving, the bullet was. The th theory is straightforward. A bullet fired in or into water will not travel very far because of all the water molecules it has to push out of its way. And we had done numerous tests in the water without me in the water, tracking every bullet's position with a high-speed camera. We had weighed all the cartridges with the most exact paperweight that we could find to make sure one of them did not surprisingly contain more gunpowder than the others. Now it was six in the morning. We had worked all night trying to get control of all the variables, discussing all possible outcomes. There was nothing more we could do. Should I stand in front of the gun and, and pull the trigger? Should I fire a bullet at myself? My rational part told me it would turn out exactly as in, in theory and tests. The other part of me though, <laughs> the irrational part, was scared shitless. It only has to fail once, and I'm dead. And to me, just the idea of standing in front of a gun, loaded, made to kill, it, uh, yeah, you can have a look for yourself, it still makes my hair stand, talking about it. <laughs> to to help you understand how I ended up in the pool that night, I should tell you, my background is in physics. I'm a physicist, and I've spent the last uh, eight years communicating science for a living, writing, giving talks, hosting TV shows. And this morning, as the, the sun was about to rise, sitting there on the edge of the pool, my rational reasoning was pulling my irrational fear to the edge. I remember asking myself, how do I take the decision whether to, to pull the trigger and fire a bullet at myself or go home? On what basis do I take that decision? Like, how can I know for sure? How do you know stuff to be true? I can tell you that when your life is on the line, these questions become really, really important. And this is how I think we know stuff. It all starts with an idea, a leap of imagination. Scientists, they have this immense privilege of standing on the edge of what we know and scoping outwards. So you have an idea of how something might be. You kind of make a guess, really. And then you form this into a hypothesis, a, a prediction, and a testable one. And after, after making sure no one has done exactly what you're planning to do, you start the trial and error. You, 
you design a, a procedure that will hopefully answer your hypothesis in the end. And then you start testing. And in the natural sciences, we have something truly unique. We have something you won't find in, in politics or economics or art. We have this universally agreed upon blueprint to test against. One that, one that everyone accepts. It's nature. If your hypothesis does not agree with nature, you need to toss it out. If your hypothesis cannot successfully predict how nature works, it's not worth much. And then there is publication, telling people about your work. You might remember this a few years ago, headlines all over the world being, neutrinos traveling faster than light. Okay, you might have to be a physicist to remember. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true, and anyway, a few weeks later, the same news channels reported something like, ha ha, scientists were wrong. Neutrinos do not travel faster than light. This was how it was seen through the media lens. This is what actually happened. A few scientists in Switzerland found something odd. Their data seemed to implicate that these fundamental particles, neutrinos, traveled faster than light, which is not possible according to the current laws of physics. Nothing travels faster than light. So they naturally assumed they must have made a mistake somewhere. So they went looking for the mistakes for years. They couldn't find any. So they published their findings in an academic journal saying, hey, this is strange. We think we must have made a mistake, but we can't find it. Can you guys help us? And the scientific world did help them. It turned out there was a fiber optic cable improperly installed and an oscillating clock ticking too fast. But I, I love this, this story because it shows a, a crucial element of the scientific method to seek criticism. In what other part of society do people go, hey, please come pull my work apart, tell me what I've done wrong? I don't think that's intuitive. It certainly isn't to me. I've, I've had to learn it. But it's part of what makes publishing so important in the scientific method. And then there's my favorite trait. Willingness to change your mind. In science, if presented with better knowledge, you should change your mind. It, it doesn't always happen. Scientists are, are humans too, but it happens. Let me give you an example, a life-saving one. Ten years ago, in hospitals all over the world, premature children were given pure oxygen to help them cope with life outside the womb. Now, Imagine, in one of these hospitals, an, uh, an experienced and highly regarded pediatrician who has given 100% oxygen to tiny premature babies her whole career and taught her students to do the same. One day, reading a scientific paper or attending a scientific conference and learning of these new studies showing it's not to the child's best. In fact, giving them a, a, a gas mix closer to what we breathe here today, like starting out with 30-40% oxygen, it decreases the, the chance of brain damage and increases survival rate. Now please imagine her with all of these 
tiny babies that she has tried to help in her mind, both the ones that survived and the ones that did not, and with all her students looking up to her. Imagine her saying to herself and to her colleagues, okay, then that's what we're going to do from now on. It happens. And this discovery alone, and doctors' willingness to change their mind, has since then saved an estimated 200,000 lives. And I think this is something we can all learn from the scientific method. To be willing to change your mind, if presented with, with new and solid information, it's, it's a fundamental thing. I mean, I trust you more if you are open to changing your mind. I think we will have a more fruitful discussion if we are all open to this idea. It, it's hard, I know, because we intuitively do the opposite. But as, I think it's worth trying. Science might be this cold, logical process. But it's always performed by humans. And we like to think of ourselves as, as rational beings. We certainly are not. And sometimes our irrationality stands in the way of scientific progress. But at the same time, the, hum the human capacity of wonder and curiosity is crucial to the process. As for me, I felt that duality of the human mind that night in the pool. We had done lots of tests, we had weighed all the bullets. The only variable changed would be me standing in front of the gun. It should perform exactly as in tests. There should be no fear, my rational, rationality told me. But then science cannot state facts with 100% Certainty. It can only say something is very, very likely. What if, just this one time, my irrationality spoke? And this is what I decided to do. Skud kommer. Tre. Thank you.